of you are glad to be in the house? Amen. Amen. Now, how many of you are glad that God is still on the throne? Amen. You know, I, I felt something while I was over here, and I know exactly what it was. And sometimes when calamity is active in our life, when we come into church, all we can see in front of us is the situation. But I came to ask you, would you just lift your eyes a little bit? And would you set your attention on the one who does not move and on the one who does not shake and on the one who can make all things new and the one who can make a way where there is no way? Come on, would you put your eyes on a God who is unshakable, who is unchangeable. I don't care about the circumstance. I'm not worried about the situation. I've got my eyes fixed on God. Mm. Let's give him a hand. Come on, if he's ever done anything in your life. You see, if, he, if he's ever healed you, if he's ever changed you, if he's ever delivered you, would you let him know with a... Ha. He told us. Come on, we got to get this heaviness out of here. Come on, don't focus on the situation. Lift your eyes and say he's the alpha. He's the omega. He's the beginning. He's the end. He's who was, who is, and is to come. Hey, hey. Amen. How many of you are glad he's still on the throne? I'm so glad. I'm glad to see everybody here in the house. I'm, I'm glad to be back home. I, uh, we weren't supposed to stay as long as we did in Illinois, but like Pastor said, God is really in control of the calendar. And we had some things break out, and God was just really, really good to us. But I am glad to be in Orange, Texas. And not believe, I know I have a word from the Lord. If you will turn to Genesis chapter 2, I won't keep you standing for too long. Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 4, I give honor again to my pastor and his wisdom and his guidance and how he leads me as I try to navigate the field, if that's what you call it, and he has just really been a light. And I want to give honor to my wife and little baby Josephine who is looking at, well, no, she's looking at the lights. Well, I love her. I love my wife. They've been so, so good. And uh, so when I was supposed to stay over and extend revival, Jackson said, you put me on a plane, I'm going home. <laughs> and I said, well, all right, so, but I'm glad to be back with her. Genesis 2, starting in verse 4. The Bible records these are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God had made the earth and the heavens and every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was not a man to till the ground. I want you all to know that even though I am home, I refuse to preach what I know. I only preach what I feel. I refuse to let what I know by being connected to this church dictate what I bring across the pulpit. And so I know, I am aware of situations, and I am aware that this matches exactly what some of you are going through. But I just want to pause here for a second and let you know that I'm not preaching this because I know. I'm preaching this because this is what God has asked me to give to you. And I believe, Vanna, this is not by accident. He's about to make a way where there seems to be no way. That's okay, I believe it. There are some things that are conditional and there are some things that are unconditional. And I believe God will unconditionally make a way for some people in this house where there seems to be no way. So I just want to preach the dormant seed. The dormant seed. You may be seated. I 
would like to bring your attention to somebody you're probably familiar with. He is an integral piece, indebatably, one of the most widely known Bible stories in the entire world. He is known as the last antediluvian patriarch, and his story begins in Genesis chapter 5. This was a man named Noah. Most of us probably already know who he is. He is famous for being the one who built the ark in preparation for a flood. Now, most people don't know this, but do you want to know the real reason Noah was ridiculed? It, it wasn't because he was building an ark. This is a common misconception in the story of Noah and the flood. He was, he was not ridiculed, nor was he ostracized because of his endeavor to build a massive vessel the likes of which this world has never seen that would sustain a worldwide flood. No, he was mocked because he warned the people that it would rain. Why? Because the earth had never seen rain up until the flood. The upper firmament was still intact. There was a mist that came up and went forth to water the face of the ground. So the people said, you know, I think this guy is off his rocker just a little bit. You know, he might be the one who had an encounter with the burning bush, Brother Rick. I'm not talking tumbleweed. It'll land when you get home. This guy thinks water is going to fall from the sky when a mist has only ever come up from the ground. He thinks something is going to happen that has never happened before. Listen, I've learned that it's not too wise to doubt what you've never seen God do. Don't act surprised when God starts doing things you've never seen before. When he starts opening up doors he's never opened before. And when he starts slamming doors shut that you've never seen him close. And it's not very wise to throw stones at the preacher. Don't ridicule the preacher when he starts preaching things to you that haven't happened yet. No, he's not lying. He's trying to sow a seed. So when he starts to preach about a revival that is coming, when a preacher stands behind the pulpit and says, I feel miracles in the room, don't say, well, well, I can't see it, so it must not happen. Have you ever stopped to think that he hears the sound of an abundance of rain? You just haven't seen it yet. But just because it hasn't happened before doesn't mean it won't. And for all the skeptics, for all the skeptics, for all the, the intellects who put their trust in science, let me just remind you of Murphy's Law. Anything that can happen will happen. You just might not be the one to see it. Oh, but I've got news for somebody. If revival can happen in the church, revival will happen. If miracles can take place, trust me, they will take place. If the sick can be healed, if the bound can be free, if the addicts can be loosed, then it's going to happen somewhere and somehow. And I believe the Lord wants to do it here. I believe the Lord wants to do it. In 3406, Edgar Brown Drive, do I have a witness? I believe revival is evident in orange. Oh, but, but I don't see it. I don't see the evidence of it. Have you ever stopped to think that somebody tapped in says, I hear a cloud forming? He said, I see something in the spirit that, that you might not see. He said, I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. What does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> but I know it means somebody was plugged into the spirit and said, I hear something's on its way. I feel a shift 
taking place. I feel something moving. I feel pieces starting to, to rearrange themselves. I'm here to tell you there's a sound of an abundance of rain here in Orange. I believe it. I believe it. I believe that addicts are still going to walk in here and be set free. I don't believe I'm the only miracle. I don't believe these people in this auditorium are the only miracles. But I believe God wants to turn this city upside down. I'm going to preach this thing till you believe it. God wants to heal. God wants to deliver. For today is the day of salvation. I'm not putting it off to tomorrow. Revival isn't something that should loom in the future. No, no. I want it here now. Not tomorrow. Not next month. I hear the sound now. And I just came out of a place that was dead, lifeless. They, they, nobody ever came to the front. But let me tell you something. When God gets ready to do something, he does it all the way. And we watched a little girl who was deaf for five years have her ears opened up right in front of me. So when God gets ready to do something, he's going to do it. But I'll hasten God is a God who will shake your world. He will do things you've never seen Him do. He'll restore people you thought would never darken the doors of a church. Many of you know I don't need to go into detail, but I was an addict who overdosed when I was 17 years old. They had to come and pull me out of a ditch, put me on a stretcher, and throw me in an ambulance. I started stepping into some things and dabbling in some things that I had no business playing with. But I'm not focused on that. Because today, I'm standing behind a pulpit wrapped up by the anointing because God is a God who will take a drug addict who's lost dying and on his way to hell and he'll clean him up and send him around the world to preach. I'm here to preach that God will restore the bound and the broken. I've watched God fill murderers with the Holy Ghost. People who came in out the streets out of nowhere. They were a part of an addict recovery group and one of them came in and said, preacher, I just don't think God can forgive me. I said, no, no, don't be that prideful. Because that's what it is. The moment you think you've out God's blood is the moment your ego's gotten too big. I said, I don't care what you've done. The Lord gave me a word of knowledge. I said, I know you've murdered some people. And that's what's settled in your mind right now. But just as God put what I did underneath the blood, God's about to put what you did underneath the blood. And I laid my hands on his head. And I watched him receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I'm here to tell you, God can still restore the most unlikely of people. And I don't mean to share a testimony. That is not mine. And some of you might know who I'm talking about. But I watched God take a family who used to sell their own blood for heroin. And he filled them with the Spirit. And today they lead your outreach here in Orange, Texas. Uh, uh, Y'all haven't got it yet. I, I know somebody. I know somebody who came from witchcraft in Mexico. And her daughters would tell me stories about how she'd sit up in bed, her eyes would roll back, scratches would begin to come out on her face. But today, she's right there on that second pew. And the daughter who told me those stories is now the pastor's wife of the Spanish church here in Orange, Texas. I feel a witness. I feel the angels of the Lord beginning to drop their ear and hear what is happening. Ah, Come on, somebody. God can still restore. God can still change. God can still use the most unlikely of people and use them to turn the world upside down. Ah, God is so good. Come on, God. Come on. God will do things you don't expect him to do. And if you're in this place and you feel like you've gone too far or messed up too many times, I hope these witnesses 
can testify with me. Let's just slap the devil in the face together and inform you that's a lie from hell. You can't outrun his mercy. You can't outrun his blood. Is there a witness in the house who can testify? Aren't you thankful? He stepped outside of the social norms and redeemed a wretch like you and I. I know I am. I preached that one time, Brother Wheeler. I said, I'm so glad he redeemed a wretch like, like you and I. And everybody sat there. And I said, oh no, I'm not too polished. I'm not too prideful to forget where he found me. But I remember I was lost. I was hopeless. I was nobody. But God came along and said, I can use that. I can heal that. I can change that. I can feel that. Come on. Has God ever stopped at your doorstep when you were bound, when you were broken, when you were busted, bruised, and beaten? I know he has for me. I'll hasten. It had never rained before, but it was coming. And once that door shut, the flood waters began to fill the earth. The firmament was open, the fountains of the deep burst forth, and water began to prevail over the earth. For those who might not know this part of the story, we're going to change gears a little bit. When things began to settle down, Noah released a dove, and it came back with a freshly picked olive leaf in his beak, which came from off of the branch of an olive tree. Now, this looks normal at first glance. A dove flies out, comes back with an olive leaf, sure. But there's something most people don't see. Something I've never seen before until recently. Something lost in the details. If an olive tree were to sit submerged under the water for five months, like Genesis records, then the tree would be dead and lifeless. On top of that, it takes about three to seven years for them to mature into a tree that is able to produce leaves, and about ten for them to be considered grown. But we know God does not contradict Himself. So how did an olive tree spring up overnight? Genesis 2, 5 through 6, the Bible says, And every plant of the field before it was in the earth. Everybody say, in the earth. And every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. This is Genesis 2, by the way. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Everybody say face. Now stay with me. God created trees and herbs, vegetation, diverse types of foliage. But he placed them in the earth. They lie dormant. They sat still. They sat motionless. Why? The Bible said the Lord God had not caused it to rain. But but wait a minute. This is in Genesis 2. During the creation account. We know it doesn't rain until Genesis 7. That doesn't happen until after the fall. When the upper firmament opens. This lets us know that God placed things in the earth that for generations people had no idea existed. They had no idea the potential that lied beneath their very own feet. They had no idea that there was tremendous growth right in front of them. Might I even say there are things placed in the Spirit that have yet to be tapped into, yet to be discovered, yet to bear witness. Why? Because conditions have not been met to bring them forth. But while these seeds sat dormant 
in the earth. While the seeds sat still, there was no sign of them. There was no evidence of them. There was only a seed. But just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. And so in Genesis 2, when God was creating, the only implication I can infer is that he knew a storm was coming. Now, I don't understand omniscience in the light of free will. No one does. But just because God knows doesn't mean God controls. But I know he could feel something brewing. Not only the fall of man, but something further down the line. And in his divine omniscience, God said there is coming a day when I will have to close a family inside of an ark and I will have to destroy every living thing from off of the face of the earth, every animal, every human, everything that has the breath of life, I will have to destroy. So in my divine wisdom, in my divine foreknowledge, I will place something inside of the earth. Before I ever form the first human, before I ever form the first animal, before I plant the first garden, I will plant something underneath. Not to disrupt their free will, but to make a way out in the future. Y'all don't even know where I'm going. Y'all about to throw me out of here. Not only will I plant provision and a place of protection on the face of the earth that you can see, but I will plant provision and a place of protection underneath what's going on, and you won't even be able to see it. Genesis 7 and 4 uses the same language as Genesis 2, for yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth. And every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. 7 and 23, and every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground. So what am I really trying to say? I'm trying to tell you that there are things that God has already placed on the inside of your life underneath your circumstance, underneath this church, inside of you, hear me, that will only be revealed when it rains. Y'all don't hear me. The natural order of things won't grow them. Normality won't grow them. But when things start to get all messed up, oh no, y'all not hearing me. When things start to move out of order, when the storm winds start to blow, that's when God says, now what I've planted is going to start to grow. What I've placed on the inside is going to grow. Now the way out that you had no idea existed is going to expose itself. Prayer will not bring it forth. Fasting will not make it happen quicker. Discipline will not do anything for it. And I know that sounds crazy, but I'm in this black leather book. The storm is what will cause the seed to grow. The calamity, the chaos, the unraveling of everything that's happening around you, that will be the catalyst for God's provision. That will be the catalyst for God's wisdom to be made manifest. And you think, see, I used to think this too. I used to think God's just really quick on his feet. He's just moving in the blink of an eye when things happen. And then he's, he's jumping over here when something else goes wrong. And when calamity is on this side, he'll, he'll jump over there in an instant. And then when it's on this side, he'll come over here and fix it. No, no. I think the song that the elders used to sing had it right. He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. 
He's not spontaneous. He doesn't jump up when things go wrong, grab his head, and say, what in the world just happened? No, no, God said, I had everything ready before the storm even started to brew. I had everything mapped out before you were even created. Vana, he created provision before that situation ever arose. He created a way out before you ever even got trapped in. Come on, we serve a God who plants a tree in the earth. And all the while you think things are dying. You look around, all you see are dark clouds and and stormy waters. All you see is destruction and chaos. But God is saying, I'm trying to give birth to something that has been lying dormant underneath your feet. I'm trying to grow something that has been a seed for long enough. So if you would get your eyes off of what seems to be going wrong, then you would understand, I'm not sending the storm to kill you. I'm sending the storm to move things out of the way that do not belong. I'm sending it to move people out of your life who do not belong. And I'm sending it because there's something buried that I buried myself on the inside that will only yield to a storm. Only a storm will cause it to grow. There's an anointing that is dormant in some of you, and you're wondering why when I'm in the middle of service, don't I feel that gift start to stir, and God is saying, no, 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 here's the direction. Only a storm will cause it to spring up. The old saying is, don't back me into a corner. Why? Because you'll see something buried on the inside of me that you didn't see. And I came here with a word I declare over this church. Enemy, be careful of backing orange into a corner because you're going to see an anointing that has been lying dormant. Come on, I feel a gift starting to stir. I feel an anointing that has been dormant for too long starting to wake up. I hear a sound coming from hell right now. And they're saying, no, no, no. I see an anointing that's starting to dust itself off. I feel a giant that's waking up here in the heart of this church. You've been telling God you want to go deeper. You want more. You're hungry for the demonstration. You're hungry for the apostolic. And God is saying this is my process. This is how I will bring about everything you've been asking me for. This is how it will come to pass. You say, is that crazy skinny preacher prophesying a storm over me? Yes, I am. And I'll stand behind it with my shoulders squared. Why? Because I'm telling you, there's a seed in your life and in this church that will only yield to a storm. There are things in my very own life that were only birthed through a storm. Hours and hours of prayer didn't make it happen. Spiritual disciplines didn't make it happen. I'm not discrediting those things. That's all great. But trials and problems have a way of exposing the gift, exposing the anointing. And so I've learned when things start to go haywire, I start rejoicing. And so if you're in the house today and you feel like everything's going south, trouble is on every front, I feel direction from God to say something is about to be revealed because God has planted a seed somewhere. God has planted the potential somewhere. And could it be that the storm is not meant to harm you, but it's meant to fulfill fill the process of bringing forth what God had promised long ago. Uh, uh. I'll be quick, I'll be quick. But the dove brought back an olive leaf. Oh, that's a cool picture. I didn't give them that. But the dove brought back an olive leaf. Not a fig leaf, not an apple tree leaf, an olive leaf. And an olive is extremely imperative in the Bible. Oh, this is good. It represents oil. 
It represents the anointing. It represents what God has marked for a purpose. I'm already smiling. I'm getting ahead of myself. (laughs) Which means the storm destroyed everything except for what was anointed. The presence of a storm will expose the presence of anointing. And there are things that God has anointed in this house. There are people whom God has anointed. There are things in your life and people in your life that God has set aside for a purpose. And when the storm comes, when the waters rise, when the winds blow, the anointing will stand. Noah needed direction. Noah said, where do I go? What do I do? What should I look for? And God said, look for the sign of anointing. Follow the oil. If you want to know what I've preserved, it's the anointing. And I believe I'm preaching to a group of people who are anointed. That's why the storms didn't kill you. That's why people couldn't take you out. The devil couldn't stop you. Why? Because you're anointed. Somebody please hear this preacher today. You didn't survive everything you're going through because you're lucky. Oh, some of you believe it. That's okay. I'm here to drive that thing out of here. Don't be naive. You're not here by happenstance or because I I just drew the right cards. The only reason you survived the storm is because God placed the anointing over you. And the anointing is what preserved you. I'm here to say this church hasn't survived all of these years and all of these storms. Just by happenstance. No, no. This church survived because there's no devil, no storm, and no person who can stop what God has anointed. And this church has the anointing. His people have the anointing. I'm going to drive something else out, Pastor, which means this church is not going down. This church is not going backwards. I don't care what you talk about in your circles. This church is going forward. I believe in the kingdom. I believe in a spotless and a perfect bride. And the Bible says that that church is moving higher. So if you're sold out to the Lord, if you're bought into the church, you don't have to worry. Because God's got you covered with the anointing. And when the flood waters rise like they're destined to do, they're going to wash away what doesn't belong. God's got a way of bringing about storms that wash away the carnality, wash away the wickedness, the drunkenness that was in Noah's age. God said there's so much, there's so much sin, but there's a tree of anointing that I've planted. And God said, Noah, you don't need to worry. The storm is going to take care of what doesn't belong. But just you wait. You want to know what God has placed His anointing on? Just you wait. See what's still standing when the flood is over. And if it was washed away, let me say something that upsets some people. God didn't place his anointing on it. If the storm blows through and washes people away and washes things away, God said, I have preserved what is in the ark. That'll land when you get home. Because there's coming a day when this ark, the ark of the first church of Orange, is going to rest on a mountain. Hmm. I wish you could see what I see in the Spirit. And it's going to settle down. And all of the the storms, when it's all said and done, 
We'll see what's anointed because the anointing will stand. The anointing says, I'm not going to move. I'm not going to waver. I don't care if the storm took me out. I don't care if the storm took my house out. I don't care if the storm took our children's wing out. I'm not going to move because the anointing will persist and survive. That's why I'm not afraid of the devil. I'm not afraid of any storm. I'm not afraid of people because the more storms they create, the more God uses it as an opportunity to expose the anointing. The flood won't kill it. I said the flood won't kill it. If we could all stand, I'm coming to a close. I'm coming off my notes right now. I'm just going to do what I feel in the spirit. I feel that there are some things that you feel God has called you to. And I believe he has. And you're saying, well, God, why am I not stepping into? There was a professor we had for personal evangelism at TBC. And he was a guest professor. He came in out of nowhere. Some of you might have heard him tell this story before. But um, he came in and said that, Roughly 10 years prior, it'd be about 13 years ago now, he said that one Halloween, his kids were out in the yard and they were playing with pumpkin seeds. They were throwing them at each other, doing what, you know, little kids do. And he said about 10 to 13 years later, his wife noticed a stump in the backyard and said, "Uh, you know, I think it's about time we got that out of here after 15 years. And uh, he said, okay, so he, he grabbed a rope, tied it up to the back of his Jeep. This is Brother Nathaniel. <laughs> he tied a rope up to his Jeep, tied it to the, to the stump, and he said he, he twisted and he turned, but finally he got the stump up. In his words, not mine. He said, my backyard was toe up from the flow up. And he said, I did, I did not have a single blade of grass in my backyard. And I said, no, there's no way. He said, no, I'm serious. Not a single blade of grass. And he said about 10 years after that, well, this is the 10 years. He said about a week or two passes, and he notices a little blade of grass right in the middle of his yard. And him being intelligent, like most of us men are, he grabbed a pair of scissors, told his wife, I'm going to cut that thing. She said, what is wrong with you? That is a sign. We might have a backyard again. You nut. And so he said, okay, I'll leave it. A few weeks pass, he notices it's not a blade, it's a sprig. He thought, well, okay. A few weeks later pass, he notices that's, that's a vine. He said, what is, what is a vine growing in my backyard for? A few weeks later, he does some research. He's standing out there looking at it. It's not just any vine. He said, this is a pumpkin vine. And the Lord spoke to him and said, that seed has been lying dormant for 10 years, waiting for the right environment to expose itself. And you're saying, God, you're not using me because of me. No, no. God's not using you because of the season you're in. I feel the angels of the Lord walking with me right now. The reason God, there are some things God has promised to this church, and you're sitting back crossing your arms saying, well, I don't see it. And God is thumping you on the head and saying, because it's not time. But once it is, no man can stop what God has ordained. And so if there are some of you in here and you don't understand why things are going on the way they are, it might be a lack. It might be, I feel so many needs right now. Let me just stop here and tell you the word of the Lord this hour is this. He has planted a seed somewhere before the storm started to blow, before you were even created. God in his divine omniscience said, I see where you're going to be in a few years. 
and I'm not moving on my feet, but I made a way out before that storm even started to blow, before those people even started to backbite you and push you out and isolate you. No, no, I created a friend group for, for you before that even happened, and they're waiting on you. Ha! You crochet. There was a time in my life where everything seemed to be going good, then everything fell off. Calendar dried up nearly two years. And I thought, Will did, what in the world's going on? Brother Wheeler, I'm not even kidding. Right when I looked at Brother Wheeler or texted him, called him, and I said, I think I want to come back home. The season spiritually changed. And you know, I text him every day of pastors who call me, the door started opening. Wasn't anything wrong with me. It was where I was. It was the environment. It were the things going on around me. The parable of the sower. Notice, there was nothing wrong with the seed. There was nothing wrong with the seed. Everything was wrong with the environment. It was where the seed was. And God said, since it's where it doesn't belong, it is the environment that is hindering the seed, not the seed hindering the environment. Is that okay? Ha. I just feel in this place that God sent me here with a word to remind some of you He's still in control. He is still on the throne. That's why I opened this whole thing up by saying, aren't you thankful that He's still on the throne? And last night, I'm going to lose some of you here. I turned the lamp off. God said, I need you to get really still for a second. He said, I'm about to show you something in orange. I said, yes, sir. I turned the lights off and I sat there. And I watched this gross darkness walk into the living room. And it loomed over the chair where I was. God said, there's a spirit of fear that has been loosed in this church. And I know where it is, but I'm not going to point you out. And God said, now flip the light on. And I flipped the light on. And it immediately vanished. And I said, God, I don't understand. And he didn't give me clarity of what that meant until right now. David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Sister Ashley, the only way for a shadow to be cast is if there's a greater light presence somewhere in the valley. That's why he said, for thou art with me. He said, the only, the only power the shadow has is what the light gives it. And I know that even though I'm walking through the valley, there's a shadow of fear. There's a shadow of death. But there's a light somewhere in the valley that's guiding me, that's leading me. If you're in this house and the Lord's been tugging on you, I wonder if you would just come. If you would begin to reach out and connect to what is in this place. I feel a troubling. I feel something stirring. 